Hello and welcome to Unheard. For more than 15 years, he worked for the CIA as a covert field operations officer. Now, he's sharing his inside knowledge of the world of security and foreign affairs on the podcast The President's Daily Brief and happens to be the most regular ever guest on the Joe Rogan podcast. Joe gets him on and I quote, whenever the world is fucked. Mike Baker is here with us in the London studio to work out how accurate that description is to the world today. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Oh, it's fucked. <laughs> well, we said, yeah. well, we, were we going to allow swearing on this yes. discussion? I guess we are. Yeah, I don't, th I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm able to get onto a, a podcast without letting one go every now and then, even though my wife says, please don't. So where I'd like to start, there are so many things that we could talk about today. It's just rewinding a little bit. You spent all that time inside the CIA, the 80s, the 90s, into the 2000s. This was an era where, for people like me growing up, we presumed that the US pretty much ran the world and organizations like the CIA, either overtly or covertly, were quietly arranging things for, in, for an outcome that would suit the United States. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't feel like we live in that world anymore. Do you a think secret that's cabal, a secret cabal of, of intel organizations. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that it's a more complex world now and it is not... It was easier to imagine that that was the case, even though it really still wasn't back then. But when you had the Cold War and you had the Soviet Union and you had the U.S., it was an easily understandable world, right? I mean, it was clear who the enemy was. It was like World War II. Everybody was wearing uniforms, right? And it's, things are more complex now. Um, and now, having said that, Vladimir Putin is very keen to get back to Soviet Union days, right? He's, he's said it many, many times. He wants to recreate the Soviet Union in some fashion. Right? And as it turns out, he, he kind of used to imply that, well, it doesn't necessarily mean territorial. It just means the influence and the, and the, the strength and power of, of Russia. Turns out he also meant territory. So, uh, but it is, it's a more complex world that we live in now. And in terms of big picture, the position of the US in that world, there's a lot of talk about multipolarity, about the, the, the end of the unipolar era. And the US is maybe now just one actor among many competing for you know overall power do you do you go along with that do you think that's true i think it is true i think in part because um you you've, you've got a shifting dynamic right russia is i mean look russia's got the gdp of a small european union country you know at the end of the day but they always punch above their weight in part because of their arsenal but when you look at china uh, the second largest economy in the world even though they're having some serious underlying issues in their economy right now uh, and you look at what they're attempting to do and what they've said they're going to do, their global security initiative that, that, that she has, has put out there over the past couple of years. He said, this is the blueprint for where China is going. What it, what it basically means is he's trying to bring uh, the majority of nations around the world into a different orbit, right? He's trying, and, and they've been working very hard to create uh, this sphere of influence all over, not just in, in the Asia area or the Southeast Asia, but over in Latin America, they've been working very hard. In Africa, they've been working very hard to create, essentially, sometimes they refer to it as the global south, right? This, mm -hmm. this idea that you'll, you'll move the US off, supposedly, the top rung of the ladder, mm -hmm. right? Reduce their influence on the world stage. And China and, and these other nations, now all these other nations are basically in debt to China by the time they finish this game plan they will be sort of at the top of the food chain. So uh, I think they're having some success in that, right? I think the U.S. has lost uh, some influence on the, on the world stage. And um, in part because in the U.S., we can tend to be a little bit, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's attention deficit disorder, right? We have a hard time focusing on more than one issue at the same time, and we have a hard time staying focused. So as an example, you look at South America, right? And periodically there'll be this leftist movement will sweep through and you'll, you'll get a variety of government changes, right? In Maduro, whatever you want to you know, use as an example. Um, and in the US, people will act surprised. Go, how did that happen? You know, suddenly the entire region is going left, hard left. Well, it's because we tend to ignore it, right? Because we're focused over here, right? We've been focused in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we ignore other areas. And that's been, a, I think, a problem for foreign policy in the U.S. for a long time. And now we are facing, or at least the U.S. is facing, multiple fronts, right? I mean, you mentioned China as one 
challenge, as they like to euphemistically refer to it as. We've got to talk about Israel and we must talk about Ukraine. I think by the end of this conversation, hopefully what we can do for our audience is give them a sense of how you, as someone on the inside, someone who understands the kind of thinking that people currently in the CIA might be employing, how they would be looking at the world. Uh, where should they be putting their resources? What kind of strategies would, should or will America be deploying to try and stay on top of this new world order? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, I think there's, on one side, right, is a, is a relatively, I don't want to say simplistic, but consistent answer, right? If you asked at the agency, if you said, what keeps you up at night? Or what, what's, what are your top priorities? Right? What are your top national security concerns? And the same would be true if you went across the, the river and asked the, the people at the Pentagon. Um, their answer, if you said the top five concerns for national security, would be roughly the same as they would have been 30 years ago. Right? So in, in a sort of a top line, 30,000 foot view, it doesn't change much. Right? Occasionally, you'll get shifting crises like the Israel-Hamas conflict. But typically, you'd have Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. And people always assume, well, terrorism too would be up there. And it's not really, right? It's, you know, for, for national security concerns, it would be infrastructure, vulnerability of the U.S. infrastructure. Because so terrorism is kind of off the hit list. Terrorism is, is, you know, even during the war on terror, the global war on terror, you know, during the heyday of, of, of that, um, it still wasn't viewed, right? With the exception of how terrorists may look at the U.S. infrastructure, power grids, water systems, transportation, uh, cash flow, you know, the banking system. Um, terrorism was never really up there, right? It was, it was a, obviously an, always a, a concern. Um, but, you know, it's been pretty consistent. China, Russia, Iran, certainly, you know, changing places occasionally in the top three. So let's dive into one of those areas first, which is Israel. Um, we're now sometime into this war. Do you have a sense of where it is and what might happen next. The most important part of where we are now um, is that I think the Israeli government has realized that their initial reaction to the 7th of October, which was medieval, right? It was brutal in its, in it, it, the intensity of that slaughter was awful. And so their immediate response was, we will destroy Hamas. We will remove Hamas from the face of the earth. So understandable as a response, right? The reality now, I think, has set in because they're now implying that they're talking about certain steps that they will take uh, once this conflict concludes, once they, they do reach a point where they say, okay, that's it. And part of that is they will are talking about building a buffer zone. They've been in conversations with the Saudis and Jordanians and others about building a buffer zone so that Hamas you know, cannot come through as they did before on 7 October. That implies that they understand that it's not a zero sum game. Counterterrorism never is, right? You never completely remove the threat. It's just, it's impossible. It's not real to think that way. So they understand that their job is to degrade them so much that you've mitigated the risk to the degree possible, right? I'm curious, in those first days after October the 7th, Conversations I've had with people in the State Department in the U.S. suggest that the U.S. was actually restraining Israel in those early days. There was unusually filtrated support. I mean, the, the statements that came out October 7th, 8th night, there was no mention of the need for restraint, no mention of anything. It was just, we are with Israel 100%. Yeah. And in a way, that was a sort of bear hug. They got so close that they got the credibility to then say in subsequent weeks and now months, you know, hold back, allow in, you know, other assistance, those kinds of things. Do you think that's true that the, the, the U.S.'s involvement is actually net as a restraining influence on Israel? Maybe I'm cynical, but I think what you're seeing is the current U.S. administration and the State Department um, talking out of both sides of their mouth, playing what essentially is to the domestic audience. Look, they give the White House credit. They unequivocally said, we, we, we stand behind you, Israel. And then the narrative changed very quickly, right? Despite the slaughter, 
right? Despite using rape as a weapon of war, right? I mean, and I'm not sure where the feminists are. Where, where, why haven't they come out of the shadows and said, that? well, that's awful, right? The, 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 they seem to be getting a free pass on, on a variety of things that they did during the course of that horrible 7 October event. Um, but the narrative changed quickly, and Hamas knew it would change quickly, right? That's why they, they know they're going to end up with a lot of dead Palestinians. That's, that's why they embed themselves with the civilian population. They understand that, and it's, it's essentially, if you want to call it their currency, because they know that the narrative will change to, it's all Israel's fault. Look at that. We were getting dead Palestinian civilians. Well, Hamas understands that. They, don't, they governed Gaza, right, for, it's new math for me, but since 2005, 2006, right? They haven't done anything for, for the people of Palestine or the people of Gaza. So uh, this is where I can get very, very cynical about all of this. But my feeling is that what happened shortly after the attacks was that the protests took to the streets. The narrative changed even faster probably than Hamas expected it would, right, given how brutal they were. But it did because it always does. And so I think the White House, and this is where politics comes into it, politics play a part in everything, right, in the U.S., including foreign policy, national security. And so they looked at the protests, and they were taking a lot of heat from the left, right? Um, and I think they thought, we're in danger of losing the youth vote here going into 2024. We're in danger of losing the Arab American vote, which is very important in the U.S., particularly in swing states, some of these states that you, you know, they, they constantly contest, Michigan being one of them. And the narrative from the White House changed. And that's when you suddenly got, yeah, but, you know, we're really, we're really working with the Israelis to tell them they have to back off. They have to, they have to be careful. Well, of course they're being careful, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's. Uh, so you don't think yeah. they were actually, you, you don't think the U.S. influence on Israel has net been restraining? Um, I think collectively the U.S. narrative, you know, that, that comes out of the White House talking about this along with the rest of the international community pressure? Sure, the, but the Israelis understand that's going to happen, just like Hamas knew how this was going to go in terms of the narrative. So I don't think it was a surprise to Israelis. Mm. Um, and so they understood, and you know, there's a, a great deal of dialogue that goes on off the radar screen between the Israeli government and IDF and the US government. And so they understood why the White House was saying you have to restrain, and of course you have to restrain. You have to, you know, you you, you have a responsibility to follow, the, you know, the, the rules of war. You have a responsibility to try to to prevent uh, deaths of civilians, right? But you're fighting a terrorist organization that embeds itself within that community, knowing that that's going to happen and counting on it to happen in order to do this, to put this international pressure on Israel. So they're in a, you know, essentially a, an impossible spot. Not to, not to say the, Israel, the, the, the Palestinian residents, the, the residents of Gaza aren't, I mean, look at it, you know, okay, you've got those that support Hamas, you know, in a full-throated way, um, but those that don't, and there's a decent number of, of, of Gazans that don't support Hamas, it's just not healthy for them to come out and say that publicly, but you can feel awful for their plight. Right? You can feel awful for their plight for years and decades, going back to when Egypt controlled Gaza. So there's, there's a lot, I guess what I'm saying is, in a rambling sort of way, there's a lot of complexity here, and it's more complex than, than you know, a lot of the, the, the youth, and in, in particular, I can only speak for those in, in the, the States, who get out on college campuses and you know, shout from the river to the sea, mm. and probably couldn't find Gaza on a map. But so how do you think it's going from each perspective? I mean, do you have any sense of what Hamas or Iran or that side were hoping to achieve from this attack? And how do you think it, the results now, six, eight weeks later, are measuring up against that? Yeah, I think they're probably their principal concern, because I'm glad you brought up Iran. I mean, look, Hamas would be essentially nothing without all the years of support, building, training, resourcing, funding um, from, uh, from Iran, from the Iranian regime. Again, not the Iranian people. Amazing whole history, culture, all of that. But the Iranian regime is the reason why Hamas exists and has a role to play. They're a proxy. And they are there, just like Hezbollah is there up north, to try to Destroy. eventually... Yeah, meet Iran's uh, objective, which is the destruction of Israel. So I think what their primary concern was, was first and foremost to scuttle the, the relationship that was possibly 
going to develop between the Saudis and uh, Israel. So you think it's a response to the Abraham Accords, basically, yeah. and it's an attempt to derail that. Yeah. How's it going on that front, though? Because by some reports, that the Abraham Accords are not going to be destroyed by this. That the there is some yeah. enthusiasm in countries like the United Arab Emirates to to move forward with that relationship. I think there is. I think it certainly scuttled it in the short term. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. But from the Iranian regime's perspective, if that goes through, if there's normalization of a relationship between the Saudis and Israel, uh, UAE and Israel, then what does that mean? That means, by definition, if that happens, that Israel has a right to exist, right, in, in the eyes of the Saudis, UAE, just like it does with, with you know, the, the existing relationships they have with, with some Arab states. And that's unacceptable from Iran's perspective, right? And so, therefore, it's unexpected from Hamas's perspective because, again, they're a proxy. It's in their charter. They're here to destroy Israel. So I think that's that was the primary objective. Uh, it just seems like it's maybe not going that well for them in that case because the other thing that surprised me is that the fear was that just as you would draw Israel into Gaza, there'd be some kind of attack from the north from the Hezbollah component and look, the year wasn't over yet, that mm. still might happen, but it hasn't happened in a very serious way so far. Right, right. What's your analysis of that? Because that was the fear that this was a pre-orchestrated pincer movement. Right, right. What? That hasn't happened. Well, and that's, that's a great, it's a great point, right? I think, look, I think in the long, if you set that over here just for a second, but if you look down the road and you're talking about the, the normalization of, of relations between Israel and, and the Saudis as an example, I think they see that, the Saudis see it as something that does have to happen, right? If you're talking, if, if your self-interest, right, is the growth of your, your country, the benefit of your people, right, getting away from, the, from oil, diversifying your economy, having stability, which will help you know, the, the region, then normalization makes sense. So I think in the long run, I think you know, the Iranians will do what they can to try to prevent it. There'll, there'll be other attacks going forward. But I, I, I think ultimately it will happen because I think these nations, every nation acts in its own best interest. And I think they'll see this in their own best interest. Collectively, I think also they'll see the, what it could mean for the region. And look, they, there's no love lost between them and the Iranian regime. So, uh, but I think when you talk about just if you, if you define, okay, what's going on inside Israel, what's happened with Hezbollah, and why haven't they joined the fight? You know, it's a good question. And I think there's a, there's a sense possibly within the Iranian regime that that might be a bridge too far. Right. So, and, so yeah. is, can you make the case, do you think, Mike, that actually it's kind of backfired from the Palestinian point of view? Mm -hmm. Because this was the big test. Like this was years in the planning, huge amount of slaughter. And instead of either a multi pronged attack on Israel, which might destabilize the state completely, or a breakdown in the Abraham Accords and normalization of relations. None of that has happened. Instead, they've just got, they've taken a huge step back in, in the Gaza Strip. There's, yeah. Despite a few protests on college campuses, Western governments have been very supportive of Israel. Mm. Uh, you could say they've taken a step back. Yeah, I think they, they probably have been quite surprised by the sort of the, uh, the aggressiveness of the support for Israel. But I mean, look, look what they look what they did. I mean, wh what else would they expect? But they don't. Again, you can't. We tend to mirror our values, right, on others. I mean, that's a, that's a you know, uniquely Western thing. Um, the U.S. does it all the time. We mirror our values, and we think that's how they're going to react. And one thing you learn in, in the CIA in operations is that doesn't work. People don't. That doesn't happen, right? So, um, y if you don't understand the culture, if you don't understand the way that group thinks, whether it's a terrorist organization or another state then, you know, that's, your, your operations could be flawed. So they're behind the curve. They didn't, they're not going to get what they want, but they will continue to try. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is, look, there, there's been over, uh, you know, six dozen uh, attacks, missile and drone attacks on U.S. facilities and personnel in Iraq and Syria just since the 17th of October. Mm -hmm. um, some 60 plus U.S. service persons injured um, some seriously, but and, and, and we have failed to deter that action, right? Because we haven't, we're, we're, we're striking out at the, at the proxies essentially, right? And there's, there's this fear within the US administration, I think, of, 
of coming out and saying, well, this, this, this is all down to the Iranian regime. Right? This, is, this problem that we're dealing with, this instability in the region for the long term, is down to the Iranian regime. The plight of the, you could argue in the short term, the plight of the Palestinian people is down to the Iranian regime because they control Hamas, Hamas controls Gaza. Right? It's, but we all, the narrative always changes. Right? It always shifts back to Israel bad, Palestinians, oh my God, terrible situation. And it is a terrible situation for them. Not Hamas, but for the residents, again, who don't support them. Just trying to, I want to get to a sense of you know, Kui Bono, who is benefiting mm. from this. And one popular conspiracy theory, at least, and you know, we like to dispel these on this show, at least address <laughs> yeah. them, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. is that the Israeli government actually had knowledge of this attack in advance, or it had there's been a big scandal domestically. Mm. I think I don't think that's a conspiracy theory that there were warnings that suggested some sort of attack might be. There's been in the a offering. report out about that, yeah. yeah. And whether yeah. they just were inadequately serious about it, or mm. whether they in some way allowed it. I mean, you you you've worked in the CIA in these kind of what get called the deep state uh, operations. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think the U.S. and, and Israel, if, if the net effect of all this is actually a, a step a step back? Yeah. Uh, for their opponents. Do you think maybe they wargamed it and, and allowed something to happen? Yeah, I've, 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 I've heard this. I've been approached by this. I've been asked about the, you know, the, it, some folks have said, well, I, you know, here's what I think. I think Israel orchestrated this whole thing so that they could move in on Gaza. And I'm thinking, okay, fine, <laughs> fine. Mm-hmm. First of all, let's take our tinfoil hats off and talk about this. Uh, I'm not buying it. You know, hey, everybody's, God bless everybody's individual opinion. But based on my experience, I'm not, I'm not buying it. So did, did, uh, did the IDF have uh, intel that pointed to something developing, an operation that was out there? Um, they're still working on it. The IDF came out over the past 24, 36 hours and said, no, we did not have this. Said, That's a false report. The report was in the New York Times. Times has have they occasionally reported poorly? Uh, yes. So the jury's out on that one. You know, one thing I always you know think is important is make sure of your facts, right? And and with something like this, right, it's like jumping out ahead of a of a, an event, right, and and saying yeah you know, before an investigation is done. So I don't know. It would be speculation on my part to say whether they definitely had knowledge. It could have been like nine eleven. We had little bits and pieces of nine eleven, right? But it wasn't put together, right? In part for because of our own structural problems with the way that the intelligence community was built at the time, right? It was a lot of silos. You talk about the need to establish hard facts. Even the death count is very hard to understand. You know, every day on social media and in mm. papers, numbers are reported of the numbers of people dying inside Gaza. How on earth do we get a realistic sense of what that is? A good example of this is do you remember? Shortly after uh, the attacks, there was a, an explosion at a hospital, right? Um, and uh, the immediate response, or the immediate word that came out from Hamas was it was an Israeli airstrike targeting a hospital, over 500 people killed. Oh my God. Well, the New York Times and, and a variety of international outlets all ran with the story based on being told by Hamas what was going on. Days after Hamas had just committed this, this horrible series of, of, of events. And they were willing to just take that word. Now, all the, those statistics since then have been coming from the health ministry run by Hamas. Everything is, is run by Hamas. So you're right. I wouldn't take their word for anything, at nothing, right? But how do you independently you know, corroborate that? It's a, it's a great question, right? You've got to, can you count on, you know, possibly access by NGOs and others who have some limited access inside Gaza. Uh, then, I mean, there's, there's, you try to triangulate in, you gather little bits and pieces and, and try to come up with, okay, this, does this make sense? Does it not? And it should be said that some of those same propaganda techniques are used by the other side as well. We've had information that has subsequently mm-hmm. been retracted, put out by the IDF, right. even on that hospital um, event that you mentioned, right. there were a number of explanations and pieces of footage and recordings of supposed conversations that I think didn't turn out to be exactly what they were claimed by the Israeli side. Right. So we are facing an information war. Oh, absolutely. Sides. And the problem is, um, in the old days, there was time to 
evaluate information. But now everybody's a journalist, right? Everybody's got their smartphone and everybody's out on social media and everybody's trying to play beat the clock with their information. So, you know, even a, a, a journal working at a, at a, you know, reputable outlet feels the pressure to get this out there, right? And we'll kind of check the facts later on, maybe. Maybe we won't check the facts. So it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. But you're right, look, no, every side engages. It's a good point. Every side engages in some level of, whether you want to call it propaganda, uh, disinformation, um, look at Russia and Ukraine, right? You, know, you try to figure out what the, you know, the, the, the casualty numbers are there on either side. It's almost impossible, yeah. right? So it's, you know, it's, yeah, you, you, you're right to, to point that out. But I think with, with the situation in Israel, going back to your original point, which is a really good one, is, you know, are they going to get what they want? The destruction of Israel. I don't think so. I mean, are they is there are they happy with a two state solution, which is now being talked again? It was talked about in two thousand whatever fourteen. It was talked about in two thousand three. It was talked about in ninety three. It was talked about in forty eight. I mean, we've been talking about a two state solution for a long time, and it's always been shot down by one side, right? By the Arabs. Now you could argue, and whenever it was in, in forty eight, when they said let's do a two state solution that Israel agreed to it in part because they thought, well, that's a step towards, you know, having the whole thing, right? So there were some, I think, within that you know, leadership at the time that were thinking, okay, let's, let's take this. We understand it's not everything we want, but we'll get everything we want later on, right? So there's a, you know. Mm. It goes back a long way. I want to come on way. to Ukraine in a moment, sure. but final thought on, on Israel. We've talked about whether the Palestinian side is getting what it wants. Mm. Do you think Israel is getting what it wants? Because the stated objective of, quote unquote, destroying Hamas, which mm. is what we hear all the time from the Israelis, what does that actually mean in practice on the ground? Right. So they're now in there. They've, they've moved into northern Gaza. They're now moving into southern Gaza. There are literally boots on the ground all mm. over the place. Yeah. Uh, they are not only shelling and rocket firing remotely, they're, they're, there, they're there close yeah. range. Yeah. How many people do they need to kill to quote unquote destroy Hamas? Where do you stop? Yeah, that's and that's what everybody's kind of wondering, and um, including I'm sure the IDF and the Israeli government are trying to sort this out because they have to balance the international pressure, right, and support, um, and their own existence. Right? And Hamas has been very clear, saying Sinwar has been very clear. Yaya Sinwar, who's the head of uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip. He's said it openly. We're going to keep doing this. October 7th was just a preliminary workup for what we want to do. Um, yeah, and you got to take them at their word, right? That's what they mean. So you've got to remove, I think, from the IDF's perspective, when you say, okay, what is enough? You've got to take out so much of that command structure, right? Military, political structure that... What does that mean? People always talk about taking out the command structure. It means killing... Sure. The people. Absolutely. That's what we're talking about. Right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I haven't heard anyone explain what that might mean in the real world. You've got to kill the leaders of Hamas, that I understand. Do you, you kill their assistants, their sec second tier, third tier command? Well, that's you, the thing. Do you with, kill with, people who yeah. you, you, run you, messages around for Hamas? Do, there was one thought. Start? During the global war on terror, you know, you can't kill your way out of the problem of terrorism. It doesn't mean you don't try. Um, I know that sounds flippant or whatever. Man, this is where I'm. <laughs> wish I was well, more you eloquent. Worked on it. You worked yeah. on it. Yeah. So, but you, but you can't. Is the answer. So you have to. You, I mean, a, a, somebody on the outside is going to look at that and go, "Oh my God, that's terrible." But all these people that are protesting, all those kids on college campuses in the U.S. who are protesting, they're the same ones who would have been at the Supernova Music Festival, mm. right? At the rave. Yeah, 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 yeah. And would have ended up dead, hostage taken, raped, whatever. Um, but they're out there supporting, you know, the, the, that that side saying, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, so I, I I don't want to sound like I don't, you, when you start talking about terrorism, you start talking about the pragmatic, you know, the, 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 the reality of what you have to do and the people that you're dealing with. Again, going back to we don't understand the brutality. It's like with the, the Islamic State, with ISIS. We, did, we didn't understand as, as a uh, the, the West couldn't get their heads around just how brutal things can be and people can be, right? So, But do you think from a security yeah. point of view, uh, they could achieve their objective? Is it theoretically possible that they could 
kill enough people inside the Hamas organization, destroy enough tunnels, do whatever they decide is the, the, the kind of key way of quote unquote destroying Hamas and then say, right, we, we're done. Hamas is now destroyed. Job done. Do you well, think that's, that is that, a that's conceivable? What's gonna happen. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Now, they're not, does that mean that they remove everybody? No, of course not. Um, you know, fighters on the street, you know, you've got a bottomless well of potential recruits, in part because, again, Hamas has spent a great deal of time with the education system teaching kids to hate Israel, hate Jews. And, 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 and you know, Israel sometimes doesn't help themselves, right? They, they, this, this conflict is going to create a whole other generation of, of kids who hate Jews, hate Israel because of this situation. They're not going to go and say, okay, well, we're being bombed because Hamas, this leadership that's stolen hundreds of millions of our dollars that were meant for improvements in Gaza and have stolen that money and put it in their own pockets, um, they're not going to think it's their problem. They're just going to look across the border because they're told to and say, yeah, it's Israel's problem. Um, but at some point, yes, that you've got to, you've got to remove, you've got to kill enough uh, of the structure of Hamas to make them impotent for a period of time. And you think that is yeah. possible then? I think you can degrade them enough, yeah, so that you essentially, are you kicking the can down the road? Well, yes. Um, is it a possibility that you kick the can far enough down the road that in the interim you come up with a two-state solution and maybe we get some, some happiness? Um, I mean, that's a really yeah. interesting idea here as well. Uh, if we're looking for kind of surprisingly positive potential outcomes, mm. that out of all of this death and destruction and what appears to be such a step backwards, somehow people might be forced into making some solution happen. I mean, it's, I have heard yeah. people speculate about that. I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a wonderful way to think about it. I personally, myself, I don't believe that will happen. I, I tend to, maybe it's just my experience <laughs> that I, I tend to be more cynical about human nature and, and, and where this goes. I don't think the Iranian regime will allow it to happen. They will continue to do what they do. They'll continue to, to support and fund Hamas to the degree they can. Um, Hezbollah, certainly, um, the Houthis, uh, others in the region to do what they can to maintain instability. Because again, if it's a stable region and people are prospering, you know, what, what is Hezbollah? What is Hamas, right? What, what, what do they mean? Right? So they, they lose their, their purpose idea. in life. Yeah. And, and again, I, I, so I think I would love to think that that would happen, but I think instead what will happen is they'll kick the can down the road in terms of the next opportunity that Hamas, you know, will do this or Hezbollah will, will decide to move in that direction. In the meantime, they'll institute additional security protocols like they're talking about, like this buffer. And again, I go back to that same thing, the fact that they're, they're discussing post-conflict additional security procedures to prevent essentially Hamas from doing this tells me that they've realized, okay, okay, we got, we, we've stepped back, right? Reality gets in the way of anger and, 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 and anguish. They're going to have to yeah. withdraw, you think? They're going to have to withdraw. And yeah. they will withdraw. Um, mm -hmm. This idea that somehow Hamas was going to be removed and, and, and Mahmoud Abbas and, uh, you know, would come in uh, from West Bank and would rule in Gaza as well. It would be unified. People of Gaza don't have any time for you know, Mahmoud Abbas and Fatah. I mean, that's, they, they got kicked out by Hamas back in 06. So I think it's, it's far more complex than uh, the White House and others. You know, I mean, they know it's complex, but sometimes they throw out these ideas, you know, like Antony Blinken, our Secretary of State in the U.S. is like, well, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to meet with Mahmoud Abbas. We're going to talk about a unified government for the two. You think, really? Okay, you know, have fun. Yeah, see it. Believe me when happen. I see it. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on to Ukraine. Okay. So we've ended now up... Now that we've solved that... Well, I think we've yeah, highlighted, yeah, yeah. in a way, your, I would say, quite bleak Thank sense you. of <laughs> Sorry, where we're that. headed, which is entrenchment and, just as you say, put it, kicking the can down the road. I'm afraid it, it looks a little bit like a similar story in Ukraine at this point. And we're now coming up to two years since the invasion. And for the last year and a half of that, there hasn't been very dramatic movements on the frontier. It, the map, we can, we can put it up here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the map of Ukraine that we are getting used to has basically the Donbass and Crimea and the connecting landmass in between as now in the Russian column. Yeah, there we go. That has been the map of Ukraine for now a year and a half. And, and every time I look, I check there's this excellent organization, the Institute for the Study of War, and I, right. they have good up-to-date maps. But 
they don't move very much. They don't move very much. It's it's kind of World War One all over again, um, and particularly now moving into the winter season. Um, you don't get a lot of movement. You don't get a lot of troop movements. You don't get you get a lot of problems with resupply during the winter. Um, so there's going to be sort of a standoff, long range war that's going to take place, right? And and uh, Ukraine can engage in that for as long as they have the support and resources from the West and from the EU and from the US. That's turning out to to be a bit of a question mark, right? But I think. Well, I guess it was. Yeah. Do you think it was already turning into a question mark prior to Israel, and that's now fast forwarded the question mark? Well, and I, I can't speak for the EU, but in the US, again, because of this attention deficit disorder and our inability to focus on two things at the same time, it seems. Uh, I don't want to oversimplify it, but um, the focus certainly in Congress, like, like switched. I mean, reporting, you couldn't find a story about Ukraine for weeks after 7 October after the attacks in southern Israel. Um, and that's not uncommon, right? We're like raccoons chasing a shiny tinfoil ball over there, right? We just like, here comes another one and we go over that direction. So I think uh, the, the, the problem with, with Congress is actually not dissimilar from the problem in the EU, which is now in the US, they said, okay, yeah, we get it. You know, we need more aid for Ukraine, but we're going to tie that to other things. We're going to tie it to aid for Israel. We're going to tie it to other issues, border security in the U.S., particularly along the southern border. Um, in the EU, you know, they, they did the same thing. They said, we'll tie in uh, additional aid funding for Ukraine to other needs, other concerns. And now that's causing problems because some of the members don't don't want that, right? And we're not going to spend any more money on anything. We're happy to spend, we're, we're okay with spending money on Ukraine, but now it's tied to other funding issues. And that's kind of an indication of, of fatigue in a way, right? Of, and, and certainly in the US. But it's your position yeah. then that that fatigue is bad and they should have been more committed and they sh we should be providing more arms to Ukraine, or is it a sense that we were always going to get to this point and we should have got there earlier. Well, I think we got here quicker than I would have imagined. Look, and it, again, for the US, 20 years in Afghanistan, right? It's a lot of fatigue built up with the war on terror. Um, but uh, countries are gonna do what they do, right? And most countries you know, vote for their own self-interests first, which makes sense. But people have to understand that. Like it's, it's, it's with the US, if you go up on, on Capitol Hill and you hear some of the Republicans talking about you know, well, no, we should be spending this money at home, right? Is, is it really our battle? <laughs> yeah, if you had said that Republicans of all politicians in the U.S. would have been suggesting, eh, just let the Russians win, because if, if, if that aid gets cut off or dwindles to some, you know, relatively insignificant amount compared to the money that's been going there, the resources that have been going there, the hardware, uh, Ukraine's fucked. Right. We, so it's OK to, to make a decision. They just have to be pragmatic about it and realize what the consequences would, would but be. But you've got we had a guy called Elbridge Colby on this show who's a senior Republican analyst. May, I think he may basically decide the foreign policy of the next Republican president if the Republicans win. He's very much about letting Ukraine be and focusing all his focus and attention on China. Mm. It feels I think you're right. There is a big movement on the political right to do that. But maybe they're right. I mean, what, what do you say to that argument that, you know, the U.S. isn't as strong as it was 20, mm. 30 years ago. There isn't enough firepower to go around. It can't mm. fight these all of these fronts. And this is is this an existential threat to the United States, the eastern part of Ukraine? Um, you know, that's it's. Do you believe it is? Uh, I believe that that uh, I, don't, I don't think eastern Ukraine is an existential threat. But I think that Putin unchecked is a real threat to um, member states of NATO and border states in particular, uh, because he's not, th that's not his intention is to stop there, right? I don't, I, I don't believe. I mean, yeah, I'm, other people have different opinions, but he's stated this so many different times in so many different ways about his desire to rebuild the Soviet Union. How, what a disaster it was, the collapse of the Soviet Union. It's in his soul, right? It's, a, it's his psyche. He's, it just, and again, we don't understand that because we're not Russian, right? And, and so 
we mirror our values and go, well, he's not behaving logically. You know, I'm sure he'll he'll settle for something else. But I think that the reality is, and, and you know, again, I don't, it's all speculation, but I think the reality is that um, this is going to end up in a stalemate at best. Is it not already in a stalemate? Well, yeah, it, incrementally, there's, there's, there's some movement, but I'll tell you, the movement's kind of heading in the wrong direction if you're, if you're in support of Ukraine, right? Because, it, you know, Russia has actually been on the offensive in, in some of these areas along the map that we've looked at. In which uh, case, yeah. I've got to ask the question. Mm. And I, I said this on the BBC, and then I got attacked for it as being a kind of Putin apologist. Mm. This was nearly a year ago when this was considered very controversial. But if we're going to have to have some kind of peace mm. negotiated settlement eventually, mm. and the choice is whether to do it sooner or to have three years of trench warfare with very little territorial gains in either direction, just a lot of dead people on either side, right. is it not better to get there sooner? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree with you in the sense that part of the pushback then, you know, a year ago, was that there was this thought process. It was still very emotive, right? I mean, in, in the U.S., people waving flags, here, yeah, stand with Ukraine, you know? A lot of those same people are going, well, I don't want to spend any more money on Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, so, so again, their attention has been shifted, right? They, so, uh, but at the time, there was this belief that Ukraine was going to regain their territory. There was a lot of talk, you know, and, and Zelensky was, we're, we're not stopping until we get everything back. Putin is never going to give up Crimea. Mm. It's not going to happen. It's his port for the Black Sea fleet, right? It's, it's, there's no way in hell that he's going to agree to or, or somehow get to some mindset where he says, okay, yeah, I guess I lost, right? He, he, he might not even be able to survive that sort of defeat at home on the political front. So does the same yeah. go, do you think of the Eastern provinces in mainland Ukraine? Uh, to a lesser degree, um, but um, I think where this is going, so I guess my point was at the time, I think the pushback was all about, well, but Ukraine's on the offensive, they're gonna do this. And then the reality sets in, again, as it always does, sort of like with Gaza, right? It always happens. You, the emotion has to be set aside. You have to look at what's happening on the ground and on the ground, as you point out, it's trench warfare. There's no, almost no movement at this stage of the game. There's going to be less in the coming months. Um, Russia's going to continue to just you know, bomb the, the shit out of, of uh, energy facilities, uh, trying to freeze them out like they did last winter. And you know, Ukraine will fire off missiles trying to hit their supply lines, right? right? Try to make things more difficult for the Russian lines. And so, yes, the answer is so there's going to have to be a, a negotiated settlement. And I, I would bet, I'm not saying that, I, you know, I, I would hate to see Putin win anything, right? But I would bet that the negotiated settlement will keep things looking somewhat like they did possibly before the invasion. Maybe there'll be a little bit of a walk back, right? Um, but, you know, right now you have to ask, what's in, in, is it in Putin's best interest to do that, to give up anything? Probably not. You know, and he's got enough support from this limited number of allies. So when you get people like Donald Trump, mm -hmm. who's saying, oh, I'm going to do a deal in 24 hours in Ukraine. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know, the, enough. The, the, the slaughter has to end. I'm going to meet yeah. Vladimir and we're yeah. going to do, it on, be huge. Gonna do it on a handshake. Yeah. What's your reaction to that? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that, we could dive into U.S. politics. But look, um, Trump. I mean, um, is it a bad idea? Um, look, it's it, how it's done is going to be more complicated than what somebody like Trump would imagine. It's going to be a handshake, right? That's not how it's going to be a, a complex uh, series of discussions and negotiated settlement. I do believe there will be a settlement. I don't believe that that anybody right, has the you know, and I hate to say this. The Ukrainians have shown Im immense ability and courage and all this. But, um, you know, frankly, they are butting up against this, this sense of fatigue in both the EU and the US and elsewhere. And Putin was counting on that. Putin knows, he understands Western culture. He's, he's smart enough to know and look at the West and go, they're gonna lose interest. So do you think there'll be a ceasefire in Ukraine before the presidential election? Uh, Let's get some predictions yeah. going. Yeah, that's, yeah, really nice. that's a good, that's a, yeah, it's a good question. Do I think there'll be a ceasefire in Ukraine in the conflict before the presidential election, which is November of 2024? And I think the answer is yet. 
No. Okay, we've got no. a firm prediction there. We can yeah. then uh, call you back if it happens before <laughs> next November. I've been known to be wrong. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I promised that we would turn some attention to China before mm. our time is up. Mm. And why not start with another prediction there? Mm. Do you think we're going to see proper action against Taiwan by China, either in the form of a blockade or something more serious in the next two years? Oh, you give me a two-year runway. Ah, I thought you were going to go with the election again. Um, two-year runway, no. No. Um, within Xi's tenure, oh, yes. It could be 30 years then. He's, he's, not, well, he's not going anywhere. He's not a young man. He's not a young man. And um, and it's also shaky, right? He's on shaky ground economically, right? There's there's a lot of little cracks in, in the in the Chinese economy, and it's created some displeasure with the party elders, right? With Xi. I mean, he's been reprimanded a handful of times that, that I think really displeases him, uh, but he also understands the realities of Chinese politics. So, you know, he has to suck it up and... and, and but you think it will that. happen? I think it will happen, yeah. And I think it'll happen within his tenure because I think he views it as his legacy. And how does the U.S. respond if that does happen? Oh, well, we're going to write several harshly worded memos to begin with. We're going to be very displeased. Um, but do I believe that we'll put boots on the ground to defend Taiwan? Um, putting my pragmatic hat on, I would say no. No matter who the president is. No matter who the president is. Yeah. yeah. So what kind of response is, is plausible? Do you think? I mean, it obviously depends yeah. on the way it happens, but let's say there's just a blockade in yes. three years yes. or, or so. The only, the choice is, do you send carriers and Navy ships into the region and ask them to start engaging with Chinese ships or don't you? I mean, it's pretty binary. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and, and honestly, I don't think China views that as their route that this is going to, I mean, and you can look at Hong Kong and probably think that's what they would like to have happen, right? The Hong Kong model, because now there's, there's no democracy. I mean, they, we were all looking this way, you know, for, for a couple of years, suddenly you know, focused on, on the pandemic. And meanwhile, they were just getting rid of the last vestiges of any democracy in Hong Kong. And I think that that's how they view Taiwan. That's what they would like to do. Very slow takeover, a very, uh, very soft approach rather than a military takeover of Taiwan, which doesn't serve their interests, really, to have a conflict in the region. Right? And I don't, I, so I don't think they want that. They're more of a rational player than somebody like Putin. They're still aggressive and they're still a problem. Um, but yeah, so I think I think it's it, they're going to be looking to do that. Now, they're very concerned about what could happen in the next Taiwanese election. Right? You could end up with a, a government, a coalition government there that's much more uh, pro-U.S. than they're comfortable with, that they would like. But they've dealt with that problem before and they've managed their way through it. So I think they don't necessarily, while they have some angst over it, I don't think they view it as a as a. As so a you'd point. bet patience, money, mm -hmm. politics will be their way of reclaiming Taiwan rather than all yeah. out. Hostility. All out hostility. Yeah. Yeah. I, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, right? But that's I mean, that's you call it optimistic. It. I'm, I'm trying to draw together these threads that we've yeah. talked about here. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's an optimistic vision of the world, Mike, <laughs> that you're sharing with us. We've got, Look at Mike. We've got, He's a, so we, we've got an yeah. Israel Gaza situation that is a necessary but very bloody, not even a step forward, just a sort of cycle mm -hmm. that seems to be starting again. And we don't even know where that's going to lead. You don't have much optimism. It's going to lead to a solution. No. We have Ukraine that was full of all of this jingoism and excitement on both sides as this kind of defining moment for the West and solidarity looks very likely like it's going to end in something approximating pretty much exactly what the Russians wanted to begin with. And there's going to be a lot of talk well, and the Russians wanted Ukraine, right? The, the Russians uh, uh, imagined that they would be marching into Kiev in, in days. Well, I don't, right? I don't think we know yeah. exactly what the Russians wanted. But. Yeah. Uh, well, Vlad told me. Uh, no, you're right. Okay, fair enough. We don't know exactly what they wanted, but you have to imagine that that was, that was the ambition, right? That was, that was the desire, was, mm -hmm. to, was to move through with the, this understanding that NATO, I mean, his, 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 definitely he was imagining that NATO would splinter. You know, there, you know it would create cracks in the organization, uh, show weakness. And he got the opposite, right? It's kind of like what we talked about and you raised with, um, with Iran and, you know, is, did it backfire on them? 
Well, certainly in the sense of what happened with NATO, it backfired on Putin. Right. Right? And it also, there's been a lot of problems. He's, his command and control structure, the morale, uh, their resourcing, um, their tactics, everything is, is demonstrated a real weakness, right? And so I think a lot of things have backfired on Putin, but he's got a resolve. Again, it's in his psyche that, that this is what he needs to do. And the Russian people have this incredible ability to suffer quietly, right? Mm -hmm. You think, really? You just keep putting up with this crap? Mm -hmm. And they've got a three to one or so advantage in personnel. They can just keep throwing people in the meat grinder, right? And then he, he doesn't care. And you know, they're recruiting mm -hmm. soldiers out of prisons. So anyway, I didn't so, need to get side. No, you're, 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 I, I see what you're saying. And then you throw in what we just talked about briefly with China, whether there's bloodshed, whether there's a war or not, it still probably ends up with China controlling Taiwan. Mm -hmm. All of these are signs of the US and that the world that the US presides over or presided over starting to look very different, where American outcomes normally brilliantly or less brilliantly, I suppose, looking at history managed by organizations like the one you used to work for <laughs> yeah. in the CIA, yeah. now just looks like a retrenchment. Uh, the US losing on a lot of fronts, having to be realistic about its limited mm. powers. Uh, am I being overly pessimistic here? Or no, do you I think don't, I don't think you are. I think, look, it's a smaller world in a sense than you know we used to live in. Right? And, uh, technology's done that to some degree. Uh, we're all more interconnected, and that has a big role to play. Um, so, no, I think it's it's a natural sort of progression. That, I, it, but it doesn't mean that the U.S. should be looking inward, right? I'm not an isolationist by any means, right? Um, I've spent most of my adult life overseas, and and a lot of it in in some pretty uh, shitty areas, and have seen a lot of different governments and regimes, right? And um, the West. Right. Um, I would like to imagine that we continue having a world where, you know, the West kind of sits at the top and, and has a say in the direction of things. Right. Because I know there's a lot of mistakes that get made. Right. But it tends to be, you know, an effort to correct those mistakes it may take a long time to turn the ship. Um, I guess my point being is there are other players out there, China being one of them, that doesn't have a worldview. It's not interested in the community of nations could give a shit about that. Um, and, you know, the instability created by a, a regime like Iran needs to be checked. And so there's a place, right? But I'm just saying it's, it's not as, like you said, binary. It's not as simple as it used to be. It's a more complex world. That so we're even if the tide is going out on US hegemony, even if it's in recession, you still think they need to do their best to try and slow that recession, or at least sure, yeah, assert yeah. global power as much as they still can. Is that I what think you would so. like to yes. see? Yes, I would like to see that because, and again, I mean, you know, I'm just people out there. They hear that, they go, "Holy shit!" Right? And he's talking about you know being the policeman of the world. No, you know, the U.S. should do the same thing as every other nation does, whether it's uh, the U.K. or whether it's China or anyone. Uh, you you act according to your own best interests, right? But at the same time, realizing that you live in a, a community on a small planet, and you would like to think that we're we're doing things with a mind towards, um, you know, uh, however you want to put it, uh, the good of that community, right? But you look at you look at places and you realize what uh, a place like China has done with the Uyghurs, right? Um, how they've shit all over Hong Kong, right? And the democracy movement that was there. Um, it's not hard to say. I think despite mistakes that get made, the West is more benign, right? It's more benevolent, sounds maybe too optimistic, but will tend to think about the impact on the rest of the world. Okay, you know, and mm. it sounds weird for someone from the agency to be talking, you know, like I've got rose colored glasses on, but you know, uh, despite having seen a lot of shit around the globe, uh, you know, I still do tend to be um, a little bit optimistic about the resilience of the of the world. And so final yeah. question for you, Mike, so, yeah. I'm, I'm going to put you on on the spot. Here. Uh oh, shit. November 2024, uh. the presidential election in the US. If and it's a big if you have a Biden versus Trump runoff, mm. which of those two candidates do you think would be better for the security of the world? 
Can I check a box marked neither? Is that possible? I don't have a neither box. I don't have a, a, a C other option. It is a cop out, but it's a good one because it's always you always have to have a, a, an exit plan. Um, and mine would be if those are our two options, um, then I'm buying a small place up in the Cotswolds. Uh, I'm still a British citizen, and I'll uh, I'll just <laughs> move operations here. Uh, look, I, I think it's likely to be Trump and Biden. Unless, you know, and nobody wants anything bad to happen to anybody. But if Biden doesn't make it to, the, to that point in time, uh, then the Democrats are already looking. Look, the Democrats have an issue here. They Let's know say it is there. Biden Trump. Biden Trump. Who is better? Um, OK, full disclosure. Uh, I'm a Republican. Um, I'm a, a, what they call a centrist Republican. So I like fiscal responsibility. I like national security, um, border security. And then I think you, government should just stay the fuck out of your kitchen, right? Don't tell you what to do with your body. Don't do any of that crap, right? Stay out of the social issues. Just focus on the things that a government's supposed to do. Security of its citizens, foreign trade, all those things. Um, so as a Republican, I look at the policies of someone like Biden and I think, wow, it's not, you know, I'm not, I'm not in line with that. I look at Trump and I go, okay, the policies are more in line with what I think. But, you know, again, full disclosure, I, I never voted for Trump, right? I'm not, I just, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't bring myself to do it, right? I knew what he was. The personality. The personality, the character, the, the, the individual. Look, I, I lived in New York City for a number of years. And anybody who lived in New York City for any number of years knows what Trump is. He's a small time tri state area real estate developer, right? Who punches people in the nose and gets punched back, right? That's what they do. That's what developers in that area do. It's a, it's a different, but, but he wasn't going to be a statesman. Right? You knew exactly what you were getting, right? If you, if you'd watched because he was always in the news in the local papers. And so, yeah, I, I wouldn't vote for him, but I like the Republican policies. So then the question becomes, okay, uh, he's got such a lead going into the first caucuses, going into the, the uh, sort of the selection process for the Republican ticket, that most people, including the Dems, the Dems are super happy if Trump wins, right? If Trump, and, and they, they talk Maybe unwisely. Up. Maybe unwisely, yeah. But that's who they're banking on because okay. they feel they if can If we didn't them. get you to yeah. say who you prefer, at least give us a prediction. All right. Who do you think is going to win? If, it is, if, it's, if it's Trump Biden, who wins? If it's Trump Biden, the reason I'm about to say what I'm going to say is that the people, the reason Trump lost the last go around was because people got tired of the chaos, right? The suburban voters, moms, uh, independents, right? People that you need to have vote for you if you're going to win that presidency. They got tired of the chaos and they either sat out the election or they voted for Biden, the other option, because he wasn't Trump. Biden won because he wasn't Trump. He didn't win because he was Biden. He'd lost two times before. He's nobody's idea of a rocket scientist, right? But he won because he wasn't Trump. So do I think those people are going to look at the current state of the U.S. economy and politics and the way things have been going and say, yeah, give me some more of that chaos? No. I don't think they will. So you think so it's Biden? I think, if, and here's my further prediction. I think, I think that those people, if they don't change their mind and they don't vote for Trump, he doesn't win. So Biden wins with Harris. I don't think, and again, not going to win. Nobody wants to think bad of anybody's health. I don't think Biden you know, makes it through another four year term. He'll be 82 if he gets elected again. And 86 by the end of the second. 86. Term. Right. And it's not about the age, right? It's about your, your capacity, your acuity, all those things. And so, cause I know some 90 year olds who are sharp as a, as a stick, but a pointed stick, uh, but you he won't make it. And that means we'll end up with Kamala Harris as president. And how's that for global security? Not good. Okay. There Mike you go. Baker, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. That was Mike Baker, long-standing CIA operative, sharing his perspective on the world. We hear a lot about the power of the deep state in the US, the Machiavellian schemes of the CIA working more and sometimes less successfully to advance US interests. But what struck me about this particular former deep stater is how little confidence he had in the US's ability to steer the world to a secure place. Whether you like or loathe Uncle Sam, the world Mike described for us with a weaker America, unable to fight on multiple fronts, to me sounded pretty unsettling and uncertain. Thanks to Mike, and thanks to you for tuning in. This was Unheard.